the most important but least well understood topics in politics. Today, I want to tell you about research that my co-authors and I have been doing on the background experiences of world leaders, the experiences they have before they enter office. The findings from this can not just help you understand who you are, but can help all of us understand the way our potential presidential candidates and potential presidents will actually behave when they make the most important decision any leader makes, whether or not the country should go to war. But do leaders really matter? On the surface, of course we think they do. That's why we vote, right? And, and as a side note, please vote, no matter who you vote for. But history, after all, is made by people. It's made by people making choices about whether a country should go to war, about elections, about political protests. And our actions and behaviors dictate the way that the world works. The question is why and how. And there's no better time to understand this than in the middle of a presidential election season. Just look at the way we talk about our candidates. From Hillary Clinton's time as First Lady, to Ted Cruz's experience as a parliamentary debater, to Bernie Sanders' experience as an activist, to Donald Trump's business career, we can take this information the media gives us about our candidates and use it to understand the way they're likely to behave when they get into office. This might seem like conventional wisdom, but it's actually quite controversial in academia and the world at large. There are two basic ways people have thought about the importance of leaders. The first, symbolized by the guy on the left here, Thomas Carlyle, is what's called great man history. It's the idea that if you want to understand the way that a country behaves, you need to understand its leaders. Or heck, just go into a bookstore and look at the stacks upon stacks of books on leadership. This, if you imagine belief in leadership as a pendulum, it's swung all the way out to one side. But many believe in the second perspective, from the guy on the right, Otto von Bismarck. He's the famous German chancellor who unified Germany in the late 19th century, and ironically, given his own accomplishments, argued that leaders cannot drive the ship of state, they can only steer it. And academic research for the last 60 years has basically sided with Bismarck. The pendulum swinging all the way to the other side. And political scientists, historians, and economists have thought that leaders are essentially irrelevant for making choices about whether or not a country will go to war. So how do we reconcile the popular belief on the one hand that leaders make a difference with decades of academic research on the other? I think we have the answer. Research that my co-authors and I have been doing on the background experiences of leaders suggests that we should actually move the pendulum back to the center and bring leaders back into the way that we understand politics. And to do that, we need to understand where leaders come from. Start with nature, immutable characteristics. Think about the universe, after all, of what makes you who you are. The successes that make you think you're good at things, and the failures that make you think twice. These are efficacy beliefs, and it's all of our experiences that make up these beliefs. And after nature and immutable, immutable characteristics, add the effect of family in early childhood. Did you grow up in a stable household, for example? What was your relationship with your siblings like, if you had siblings? Now add the effect of education. Add to that early occupational experiences in what many psychologists argue is a critical time for the risk propensity that people have later in life for their worldview, sort of late adolescence, early adulthood, a time when if people are going to serve in the military, that service tends to begin. Finally, add your adult family characteristics. Are you married? Do you have children and the like? Just like all of us, leaders are the products of their experiences. So my co-authors and I set about trying to study leadership, and we built the largest database of leader characteristics ever created. It covers over 30 leader characteristics, over 2,500 leader backgrounds from of the late 19th century to the early 21st century. That's every leader from every country around the world. And we can use the tools of data science then to build a model that helps us predict, based on those experiences, the way that leaders are likely to behave when they get into office, and especially the choices they make about international conflict. And the result is lead, or the leader experience 
attribute descriptions data set. And I want to give you a look at it. This is the set of background characteristics that we gather data on. You can see here military service, upbringing, family background, educational experience, and the like. And we take all of these experiences and, and put them into a model where we build out a leader risk score, or the risk propensity of a leader, just based on their background experiences, to engage in the sorts of behaviors that are dangerous, like, say, starting a military conflict. So what did we find? Four key insights. The first is that leaders matter everywhere, but the extent to which they matter depends on the kind of country they rule. Take a look at this chart behind you. On the vertical axis is the probability that a country starts a military conflict. On the horizontal axis is the type of country it is. On the far left are dictatorships like North Korea. On the far right are consolidated democracies like the United States. The blue line shows that the effect of leader risk depends on the kind of country you're ruling in autocracies countries that lack the checks and balances of the United States, the effect of leader risk is higher. Because when you have a very dangerous leaders, leader, you don't have a lot to constrain them. So they're more likely then to have the ability to start a conflict. But note, if you look out on the tail here, that the effect of leaders is still significant in a democracy. This is one reason why you need to vote. Because who we choose matters even in a democracy, for whether or not a country like the United States will actually go to war. Second factor is that some characteristics matter more than others. And one in particular that seems to make a difference is people that have served in the military but have not seen combat. Look at all the people that have had this in common, from Kaiser Wilhelm II, who started World War I, to Libyan dictator Gaddafi, those with military service but not combat experience have had all of the positive socialization associated with being in the military, but none of the negatives of actually seeing, facing the risk of death, or seeing friends die on the battlefield. Note that this model does not apply to all leaders. In the upper left-hand corner, you have Jimmy Carter, far from you know, someone we think of as the most aggressive American president. But in a model with 2,500 leaders, there will be outliers, and, and, there, and there should be. But what this demonstrates on average is that those with this particular experience, those with military service but not combat experience, tend to understand the positives of military force, but not the potential negatives. The third thing is that the lead model, when we use it to forecast on leaders of today, actually does a very good job of predicting the kinds of leaders likely to, engage, likely to engage in dangerous behavior. For example, former KGB agent Vladimir Putin shows up in our model as in the 90th percentile of world leaders. And you know, note the exciting picture of, of Putin here you know, in the race car. I chose that over Putin with wolves, or Putin with a machine gun, or you know, Putin with a bear. Or, you know, they're all, just Google Putin pictures, all sorts of fun stuff online. <laughs> the, Another person who fits this, though, is you know, the smiling man below, Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader who threatens the world with nuclear weapons and, and long-range missiles. And that our model successfully predicts that both of these leaders are dangerous. Not Hitler dangerous, Hitler's in the 99th percentile in our model. But dangerous suggests that this is something you can actually trust, and this is a tool that's useful for understanding the way that countries are likely to behave. Fourth thing, gender. What you, see, uh, what you see behind me is, what, is a box plot showing the average risk of starting a conflict, sort of the average leader risk score for male leaders and female leaders. And what you'll note is that it's almost identical. There are tough female leaders like Margaret Thatcher of the United Kingdom or Golda Meir of Israel, just as prone to starting military conflicts as male, conflicts as male leaders. But there's an important caveat here, which is that there haven't been that many female leaders. So the extent to which we can derive accurate statistical predictions from the pool of female leaders is actually pretty small. Hopefully that will change over the next generation 
and we can get a better understanding of the effect of female leaders. But for now, what the results show is that female leaders actually behave in ways almost exactly the same as male leaders when they're in office. So, what does this then mean for understanding the 2016 presidential election? Since once we, had, once we developed the lead model, we can put anybody's characteristics in it. We can put my life experiences in it, we can put your life experiences in it, we can put a presidential candidate's life experiences in it. And we did just that. With the caveat that what are called out-of-sample statistical predictions should be treated with caution, here is what we found. Hillary Clinton, the former Secretary of State, former Senator, former First Lady, shows up in our model as almost exactly in the middle, as an average American leader when it comes to the probability that she would use military force. The US president that she's closest to is George H.W. Bush. And this fits in many ways with the way that we think about Hillary Clinton and how she's, uh, and how she's campaigned and the way that she's presented herself. What about Donald Trump? Donald Trump actually looks different than you might suspect based on his inflammatory rhetoric. Donald Trump actually shows up in the 20th percentile, 2-0, 20th percentile in terms of dangerous leaders. So why might that be the case? If you look closely at Trump's foreign policy speeches and foreign policy statements over the last 30 years, as many have started to do, you actually see a fairly consistent pattern emerge where Trump indicates being uncomfortable with American leadership in the world and views American allies and partners in Europe and in Asia more as a burden than a benefit. If that's true, and that's actually the way that he would govern as president, it actually means he would be a lot less prone to use military force than any American president since World War II, which is exactly what the lead model predicts. Keep in mind, though, that the lead model only captures the background life experiences of world leaders and how it will affect their behavior when they get into office. Other things, like ideology, can still matter. So to conclude, I think that the lead model and the study of the background experiences of our leaders tells us something important about us. Biography is not destiny, but it certainly shapes our behavior, and we can be more informed citizens and make smarter choices by learning more about our candidates and trying to use that to understand the way they're likely to behave when they enter office. Thank you.